Please open your Bibles now to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. When you find your place, look down. Why do they say look up when you found your place? You can lose your place when you look up. Why do they do that? Who are those people that do that anyway? You know, they, we're always talking about them, aren't we? People that aren't us because we're, you know, we don't make these blunders in life. All right, Hebrews chapter 13, if you found your place there, uh, if, you, if you don't have a Bible, there should be some in the, in the pew or the uh, chair racks in front of you or around you. And feel free to make an effort and grab a Bible because we want you to know that what's preached this evening is from the Word of God. So it's important that you have your own copy of the Scripture so that you know whether those things are so. We found chapter 13 of Hebrews, or I mean chapter 13 of Hebrews. Let's look down at verse 1. We're going to read uh, the first several verses, and uh, actually quite a few verses all the way up to verse 17. So if you'll just bear with me and pay attention, there are a lot of, a lot of just terse, short thoughts that kind of conclude this letter to the Hebrew Christians. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them which have been occupied therein, or that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of the, those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And then we'll read verse 18 because it sort of transitions us into uh, not just commands, but transitions us into kind of some final words to the Hebrew audience in particular. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Well, let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us teach us some important spiritual truths from the commands in the Scripture this evening. Father, it really is a privilege to have a book like this, especially, Father, a portion of the Scripture where the Holy Spirit so earnestly exhorts us to continue on in the faith, to continue to serve Jesus Christ, to not go back, to not look back. Father, I pray that these commands that are intended for the sake of helping us to continue on the course would become regular thoughts in our lives and regular actions that we perform. Help us to think the way that your word commands. Father, help us to act the way that your word commands by your spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's sad to me whenever we get to this portion when we're studying through it book of the scripture because there's just so much here and I really feel like I could preach Hebrews constantly uh, for years and years to come but yet we're already 
at the end of the book. And um, the, the scripture is so packed with practical, helpful doctrine. And even as we finish out this letter to the Hebrew Christians, there are so many commands that really settle us and even have a lot of doctrinal implications, teaching implications. But this is really a practical portion of the scripture here. We know that Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians who are Israel according to the flesh, but they're also Israel according to the flesh, to the spirit. They're completed in Jesus Christ, and they're going through terrible struggles. I believe her, not to minimize anybody's life struggles, but, you know, persecution and hardship is a part of life. I've said before that if you have not endured great tragedy and terrible sorrow in your life, it's because you have not yet endured terrible tragic, tragedy and great sorrow in your life. It's not because it will not come. My friend, those days will come. It's interesting, you speak to, to folks that have lived a little longer, it's interesting the perspective that they get up, or, up in years later on in life. I have a great aunt, uh, my great aunt Margie, she's 97 now, and this last two years she's become frustrated with life. And it's just interesting talking to her, she's always been upbeat and positive, but she's kind of mad now. And she's mad that everybody keeps dying. A little frustrating to her, you know, you, you get to be... Uh, about my age, I'm 30, 37, right? Yeah, I'm 37 now. And um, you start seeing people your age dying. I can think of probably offhand four or five of my friends that I went to college with uh, that have died in the last couple of years. You just hear sad news. You find out that they've died. My sister died three months ago. She's a year and a half older than me. And um, you, start to be, you start to go through these things. You start to realize, man, we're not going to live forever. And it becomes kind of a reality to you when you start losing folks. And then um, as you get a little further in age, you start realizing that a lot of the people around you have gone. And like my great Aunt Margie, you know, for her perspective now, her generation's gone. She's the last one. She, she doesn't have anyone her age that's still around. And then her... The people that would be the age of, you know, her nieces and nephews, she never had children. They're starting, they're, they're almost all gone. And uh, it becomes pretty troublesome, pretty cumbersome in your 90s to make new relationships and have new friends. You just start feeling really alone. And that's part of life. That isn't terrible suffering and tragedy. That's just part of living life. That's some, one of the things that you realize when you talk to folks that, are getting up in years, you realize it's just one of the things you deal with. And, um, but these folks are dealing with more than anyone else. Because they're living in a time and a day and age when it is not safe to be Israel according to the flesh. It's not safe to be Jewish. And to top that all off, being a Christian made it so that they were ostracized from their unbelieving family. And so the persecution they endured was so terrible that not only were you hated in your country because of your ethnicity, not only were you despised and under persecution and in danger for your life, but you actually were put out by the only people that could understand what it was like to be born Jewish and have nothing to do with it. How would you like to be born and hated just because of the ethnicity in which you're born? Some of us have an idea of that, but honestly nothing like what these individuals had. Hated just because you were born. And then on top of that, hated by those who you had in common with your nationality. And so the response of it was that these individuals, after they tasted, after they'd grown spiritually, after they had um, endured some hardness and persecution, got discouraged. They got tired out, worn out. And many of them began to go back into Judaism just because it was bad enough to endure persecution, but it was worse. It was worse to have persecution from those that ought to understand and love you. And the author of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews, and by the way, the Holy Spirit did write Hebrews. You'll read chapter 13, you'll see a reference to Timothy being out of prison. You'll think, oh, it might have been Paul that wrote Hebrews. It probably was Paul. Well, uh, you don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews, and I don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews. I have some conjectures. But the truth of the matter is, I believe that the author is unknown because the Holy Spirit wants to have the emphasis. 
wants to have that place of preeminence. Doesn't want a man uh, to be the one that wrote this. Really wants to let him know that it's God. And also because Jesus Christ is seen throughout this letter as superior in every way. Superior to the angels. Superior to Moses. Superior uh, to Melchizedek. Superior to the priesthood. He's a superior sacrifice. He's superior. Uh, the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. Jesus is everything and He's better in every way than everything else. And there are five warning passages in Hebrews that not only encourage believers that because Jesus is better to go on in the faith, but warn them of the dangers of going back. The dangers of not going forward in the faith and the sure end and destruction that would be a result of not going forward in the faith. And last week we had a um, <laughs> one of the kindest warnings that you possibly could have been made. We saw the picture of God's person toward man, His presence in the Old Testament, and it was typified by Mount Sinai, which when God was on the mount, you remember, the mountain turned black and was dark and smoke came off of it, and any man or beast that approached it was to be stoned or put to death for coming near God's presence. And the argument was that if in that covenant and if in that time period the presence of God were such a fierce, terrible thing, and if approaching God in His presence at that time were such a terrible thing, what must it be like today for us if we don't endure? And verse 22 of chapter 12 said, You're not, or you're come. Under Mount Sion. Before it said, You're not come unto the mount that might not might be touched, but you're come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavy, heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable country, company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made, made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And we end, instead of this terrible, threatening warning, we end by realizing how much better it is to just come to Jesus. Instead of being told of the terrible things that will happen if we defy God and if we don't move on in our faith, we are told of the wonders of heaven and of our Savior. And then we're told, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. And then after we've been told of this different picture of God, that literally we're able to go into the throne room of God to approach His holy presence because of the person of Jesus Christ. And as in chapter 10, we saw that we're able to have boldness in doing so. After we're reminded of that, we, are, we have the conclusion that our God is a consuming fire. Friend, our God today is not any weaker. Our God today is no less capable. But because of the person of Jesus Christ and His mercy toward us, we have a position that is unlike that which has ever been had in times past. And for any person to have the illogic of going back into a time when God was literally typified by His burning presence, by being under a law that could never be kept, going into a sacrificial system which at best was a temporary sacrifice, having high priests who are just taken from among men, that their work is at all times, in every way, temporary, we're told that we have a high priest which is in heaven who is sitting down because his work is finished. And in every way, the situation that we have today is better than it has ever been before. My friend, we ought to be glad to be alive today. It ought to thrill our hearts to know that we live in a day and an age where literally things are better than anyone in the world has ever had it before. Love reading in the Scripture, 1 Peter is one place, but many places where the Bible shows that literally the angels and uh, literally every generation before us, including if, if you study Hebrews chapter 11, it's another one of those places, individuals that went before us believed in faith, but we're the ones who received the promise. What a great thing it is. Has God been merciful to us? <coughs> Believer, we have anything to whine and complain and be ungrateful for? No, we don't at all. But sometimes actions, if they're not right in the life of a believer, will lead us to that place, which is a place of danger. And that's how we conclude Hebrews 13. There are actions, things that we could do that would keep us from pleasing God and going on in the faith. And so let's look at those. It won't take us a terrible long time. There's, they're all pretty self-explanatory and meant to be understood. First of all, 
Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. I love 1 John chapter uh, 3 and verse 16. Matter of fact, don't turn there, but I'll just read it to you because it really carries with it, uh, carries the idea of what we see here. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And love is always sacrificial. Love doesn't look at me and say, what can I have? Love says, what can I give? And because of who Christ is, because God is a consuming fire, the next thought initially that we see is, let brotherly love continue. Whereas don't stop sacrificing, don't stop loving your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. You know, Christian, the day you stop loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is a day that you're turning back. It's a day you're going back to what you were before Christ. Let brotherly love continue. Pretty simple. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. <laughs> I don't want to get off this evening telling stories about people who think they've seen angels. If you've entertained an angel unaware, you're unaware you've entertained an angel. I don't want to get too far into that. I know a lot of people, I think it was an angel. And it always is because the person disappeared, you know, after they the person showed up on a scene and helped or whatever. I've just heard a lot of stories about this. And my thought on it is, if you've entertained an angel unaware, you're probably unaware. But you know who a stranger is. And you could entertain a stranger, and a stranger could be an angel unawares. Not an angel unawares. That's not a description of the angel. That would be the way that you would entertain an angel. You wouldn't know it. Hey, we ought to treat everybody a certain way, aren't we? And don't go out in the community in uh, Fort Lauderdale and think, well, nobody knows me. I was realizing, I've been realizing this last week or so. It seems like everywhere I go, people, I know people there. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's frightening a little bit. It's a little reminiscent. Of, I grew up in Kansas. And in the town that I live in, in Kansas, uh, that I lived in, in Salina, everybody knows everybody, but particularly the Price family knows everyone. You can't go anywhere with my dad or with my, with my uh, grandma and get anywhere in a timely manner. You go in a store. Melissa and I, we did this, didn't we, last time we were there? It was just, we went to a garage sale. We were on our way somewhere. We stopped at a garage sale. And we're at somebody's house, and my dad goes walking basically into the guy's backyard and into their garage in the back. And I'm just like, what are you doing? Well, of course he knows him. He knows everybody. <laughs> he knows everybody in town. You know, and ends up going through the guy's garage and buying stuff out of his garage that wasn't out front. You know, I'm just like, you know, it's pretty interesting, but it's interesting in, in, a, in a city the size of Oakland Park after a while. You've been here for a long time, and if you've interacted and you've witnessed to people, you've gotten to know people, you know everyone after a while. It's important, isn't it, how we are with our testimony. But it's important for us to also realize that God could have us entertain an individual for whatever reason, I don't know what God would want us to minister to angels for, but it certainly would be a test on our part, I would think. It would be God giving us the opportunity to be what we should be toward everyone. We ought to practice the omnipresence of God. And that's one way to do it. It's recognize God's everywhere. God has angels everywhere, and we better be careful not to forget. We better not forget to entertain strangers. We better treat people the way people ought to be treated. We ought to treat our brother and Brethren, the way they should be treated, we have to treat everybody else, including strangers, in the same manner or similar manner. Then we find a statement, and this is one that ought to bring us great conviction in the days that we live. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. I fear that we grieve too little for those individuals that are enduring persecution in our day. I, sometimes I don't know what to do. Sometimes I, I almost feel like I should go there and be persecuted with them or that somehow we should endure. But God help us. God help us to have the wisdom to obey this Scripture. Literally around the world there are individuals that are suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ. And friend, we better be careful not to turn a deaf ear. If we can, we should remember those individuals. I shouldn't say if we can. The Bible doesn't qualify it that way. The Bible says to um, remember them that are in bonds and remember them which suffer adversity. Here's a practical question for us. Have you done anything in the past week 
Just practically speaking, have you done anything in the past week about those individuals who are suffering? Have you done anything about suffering? Well, Pastor, I, I don't know where they're at. Well, have you prayed for them? That's pretty minimal, isn't it? I think we should pray two prayers regarding those that are in bonds and that are suffering adversity. First of all, God, be with those that are in adversity, and God, show me what I should do. Those are two practical things we could pray, aren't they? God, protect those, be with them, and God, show me what I should do. We at least pray for them and pray that God would show us something. I, I'd be glad to entertain an idea if somebody knew what we should do. Honestly, we're so protected. We're, we're fast losing because of our lack of exercise of our liberty in this country. We're fast coming to a place of persecution. And it may be that our solution is that we'll be right there and we'll be able to be very practical about this command and it'll be more real to us in the near future. But today, it's a Bible command. And it's something we ought to strive to obey and it ought to be something that ought to keep us aware. And I believe it's one of those things that will keep us from turning back turning back to where we were before we came to Jesus Christ. It's important. It's interesting. Out of all the things that the Holy Spirit could have given us, that He gives us this truth. And it ought not to be something we just pass over and say, well, we don't know what to do. It ought to be something that ought to trouble our hearts and ought to be a matter of prayer. Okay, then. Marriage is honorable in all. In verse 4. In the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. This is, this is a simple, important truth. There is no such thing as a loss of purity in marriage. Marriage is pure, period. God has made the physical relationship for a man and for a woman to be in the confines of marriage. And God holds that as such an important thing, so much so that the Bible says God will judge anything else. It's an important truth. Physical purity is very important. Then the Bible says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember to desire your relationship with God above anything else your heart could desire. If you want something more than you want and earnestly desire a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, It'll be because of covetousness. It'll be because of wanting something God doesn't want in your life. And if you want to define covetousness simply this evening, it really is wanting something God doesn't want for you. Whereas I want something God doesn't want for me. God wants it for someone else. We're just not to have envy in us. We're not supposed to want something God doesn't want. We want, need to just want what God's given us. It's pretty simple. If you stray from that, Christian, very soon you will be going back in the faith. Then in verse 7, we'll pass over that because we'll come to it in verse 17, same connected concept. And so I want to read right down to verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And because of that, verse 9, be not carried about with divers strange doctrines. If Jesus is always the same, the teaching about Jesus is always the same. And that is precisely what the scripture indicates here. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then we shouldn't be changing. If He hasn't changed, Christianity hasn't changed. It's interesting, and I don't want to get off into this, we've already addressed it, but it's interesting our Supreme Court seems to think that God has changed. Now I know that they're deliberately not acknowledging God and all that, but they've said, well, marriage has always been this, but that's kind of outmoded. And so we're going to change it. And today the question Many people are asking particularly, well, in a lot of denominationalism, but particularly in the Catholic Church, because it looks as though the Pope is about to sanction homosexuality. Um, the question is, has God changed? Was it wrong 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 500 years ago, and it's not wrong today? Well, the Bible says don't be carried about with divers strange doctrines. Jesus hasn't changed and our doctrine shouldn't. It's practical. The Bible says it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them which have been occupied therein. The idea is the same, same material that you find in Romans chapter uh, 12, 13, 14. Here we find a portion of Scripture that's, if we don't get any further this evening, that I want to cover. 
this evening because this, uh, this is one of those portions of the scripture that teaches us the truth about Christ that ought to thrill our hearts. We have an altar wherein uh, where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought in the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. And there's the, the analogy of the sacrificial system. And these would, of course, uh, be sacrifices that the priests couldn't eat. I gave you some cross-references. We don't have time to look at them this evening, but it's what's being alluded to here in the Scripture. Leviticus 6.16, 6, 6.30, chapter 4 and verse 7, uh, and chapter 4 and verse 12, uh, Leviticus uh, 16 and chapter uh, 15, and then chapters 27 and 28 that talk about sacrifices. One of the things that we find is that some of the sacrifices for sin would happen when the individual would bring a bullock or they would bring a particular sacrifice to the temple and a priest is going to offer it and a man would put his hand on the bullock signifying the transfer of his sin onto that sacrificial animal. And that animal has now become his sin and must die. And so you cannot bring that animal's body into the temple, can't even bring it to the altar. What would happen would be they would take it outside the gates of the temple, they would slay the animal, they would drain its blood, then they would bring the blood into the temple, and they would sacrifice the blood on the altar, signifying its blood being shed because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and signifying, of course, ultimately, the sacrifice that is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit in Hebrews wants us to understand the analogy between the sin sacrifice of a bullock or an animal that couldn't be brought in and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified without the gates of Jerusalem. And His body is left on the cross while His blood is shed and His blood is offered in heaven as a sacrifice for our sins. And of course, at this point, there's a great amount of sorrow, realizing that the lifeless blood of Jesus, or the lifeless body of Jesus, is hanging on a cross of shame outside of the camp, while his life's blood is offered in heaven. At the same time, our sins having been levied on him, God is looking at him in the fierceness of his wrath and the hotness of his anger as though he had committed the sins for which we ourselves deserve to die. Some individuals have taken this passage of Scripture and come up with strange doctrine. I don't think it's worth our while even to address that this evening. I don't want to talk this evening about uh, the Lord's Supper. Some people have taken Matthew 26. When Jesus says, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, and they believe that the body and the blood become, I'm sorry, that the bread and the cup become the body and the blood literally of Jesus and they're perpetually those things. That isn't what the Scripture is teaching here at all. The application for this verse, though, is very direct and it's in the text. We don't have to study hard to find it. The Scripture explains itself. Keep in mind as well how simple the other statements have been thus far. This is not veiled or hidden truth. It's laid out there for us to understand. And so looking down, if you will, with me this evening, in verse 13, the Bible gives the command, let us therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. In other words, here Jesus is outside of the camp and his body is, uh, is, is literally held up in shame. Literally, he doesn't even have access to the temple because... Our sin has been placed upon him, and he has all the shame, all the wrath of God, all the reproach on him. And we as believers, the Bible says, need to go forth therefore unto him without the camp. In other words, we need to be not afraid to have the place of reproach for the sake of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples many times, didn't he? They hated me, they'll hate you. Christian, it is a powerless religion not the grace of Jesus Christ which would enable us to live a life without shame 
without reproach. There is a reproach that comes with the identification with Jesus Christ. Not because of His works, but because of our sin. Not because of His position, but because of ourselves. And when we are called to suffer for His sake, or to suffer with Him, it ought to be something that we ought to gladly do. I think of the contrast between those disciples which forsook Jesus and those few that were there with Him on His cross. I think of the mother, His, his earthly mother, who saw Him born as a virgin, who saw Him live the sinless life, who certainly must have been devoted to Him and saw her need of Him as her own Savior, more probably than anyone else. And watching Him die on the cross of shame. And certainly, as they despised Him, those mocking crowds surrounding Him must have despised her as well. And yet she did not forsake Him. Think of John being in that place. And though the other disciples, including Peter, had forsaken him, he's standing there, and yet he'd not forsaken him. Christian, this is not this, you know, this isn't a test to see what you're made of. But reproach does define us, doesn't it? Reproach does show what we are. And we as believers ought to always be vigilant, ought to be always careful not to be afraid to suffer shame for the sake of our Savior who has been held up to a place of shame for our sakes. We need to identify with the shame that's in the cross. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips given thanks to His name. We ought to sing the songs about the blood of Jesus. We ought to give grateful thanks. I love the song we sang this evening. I'll praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Boy, what a fitting song all the songs were this evening for this portion of the Scripture that we see here. And we see a couple of important statements and we'll finish up. I know I've gone a long time this evening. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For what for such sacrifices God is well pleased. Sometimes it's easy in passing through life to become self-centered, isn't it? It becomes easy to become about us. And the Bible says to do good, to communicate, to, to literally take an effort that goes outside of ourselves to be for others. Don't forget to do it. Then the same phrase that we find in verse 7, beginning in the verse, is a similar phrase, a similar description, is in verse 17. Obey them and have the rule over you. I don't want to argue about it this evening, but this is speaking of the leadership in the church, the pastor. I've had good Christian folks say verse 17 isn't, but if you read verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. That's not talking about secular leadership. So individuals that would argue, well, you know, remember them that have the rule over you. That's talking about rulers and kings and and that sort of thing. Well, the Scripture certainly does deal with those individuals, but that's not what the Bible's talking about in this passage of Scripture. And there are some important statements here. The first word is obey, and the second word is submit. Obey and submit. Obey them that have the rule over you. Um, I'm convinced that a pastor is a shepherd. <clears throat> He's not a cattle driver. Uh, you lead sheep, you don't herd them. And there's a big difference, and I've seen both. I've I've seen, I've seen individuals in the pulpit who demanded to be obeyed, who demanded uh, that individuals follow their leadership. And uh, I've always realized, I think, or realized for a long time that you can't have loyalty for demanding it. I know individuals that demand that people be loyal to them. And uh, they'll be loyal until they can get away from you, as what my experience has been as I've observed that. And they'll turn against you at that point. Um, but the Bible does command obedience. Why? Well, because God wants leadership in the church. God uses leadership in the church. A pastor's not a ruler. He's a Christian. He's a member. I believe in congregational rule in the church, but there's got to be leadership. And God made it that way. 
and God wants the leadership to be obeyed. Obey them to have a rule over you. And the Bible says submit yourselves, which means to put aside what you want for what they want, for the vision, for the, for the work. And here's the reason why. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account. The day I was ordained, Dr. Shermerhorn preached this passage of Scripture. It's a message that is probably one of the best messages I've ever heard him preach. It's a real help to me. And he talked about pastoring with joy and pastoring with grief. Sometimes a pastor is called to pastor with grief, literally individuals that will not obey, individuals that will not submit, and they're the ones God's given you to have a ministry with. And you have to deal with the problems, you have to deal with the circumstances in the church, and it can be grievous. Sometimes you have the opportunity to pastor with joy. But you know who makes the decision about that? Pastor doesn't, God doesn't. You do. You make the decision about whether or not <laughs> pastor gets more white hairs, this week, or uh, whether um, he gets to just rejoice and have an easy life. You know something? From pastor's perspective, my calling is to feed the flock of God. <coughs> my calling is to do the work of the ministry. And uh, I answered the call, whether it be with joy, whether it be with grief, I'm serving God. But it's an important reminder to us that how we live does affect others. We don't live unto ourselves. Romans says, No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. It's important for us to understand that what we do does affect and hurt or help others. And our actions matter. Christian, aren't you glad your life matters? Ultimately, the scripture says here, if, if, if he does it with grief, that it's unprofitable for you. It'll hurt you. It'll, your, your outcome will be that you're harmed. But your life matters. God loves you. He showed it forth when Jesus died on the cross for your sins. The Christian life is simple. It really boils down simply to obedience. What you know the Bible says you're supposed to do, just live out in your life. Just do it. Do it with the spirit that you're supposed to be doing it with. Do it with the right attitude. And your God will supply all your needs. And you'll find out that life is positively wonderful. And sometimes you'll endure hardness. You'll endure uh, either persecution or reproach. Or you'll endure... Uh, suffering, but if you keep your focus on the cross of Jesus Christ and you are careful to be willing to bear the shame that comes with him. See, these are individuals that have enough shame just from their ethnicity. They're not willing to have the shame that comes from being a child of Christ. But friend, if you just keep your perspective right about that, when the time comes, you'll already have the character, you'll already have the determination that'll get you through it. And hard times are coming. I don't speak, I'm not a gloom and doomer. You know, I know people, well, we're living in the last days. You know, we've always been living in the last days since the early church. Been living in the last days for a couple thousand years. Well, these are the last days. Well, that certainly is true. It has nothing to do with anything, actually. Wars come, wars go. Persecution comes, persecution ceases. Times change, but Jesus is always the same. But you and I can be just as consistent as Jesus is by simply obeying the Word of God, following His faith, and looking at those examples of individuals that have gone before us, and we can please God with our lives. If we keep our perspective right, life will be really good. And I hope that life is good for you this week as we practice and obey the Scripture. Father, thank You for what You've taught us from Your Word this evening. I pray that You would thrill our heart with this truth, that You would give us a steadfastness and assurance as we live for Jesus. Lord, help us to be careful about the matters that we're uh, commanded to obey in the Scripture. We pray that you'll help us to do these things now by Jesus and by His Word. We pray it in His name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.